So I've, I've got to confess to you that 20 years ago, I was envious of another church. Now, I, I'm sure it comes as a surprise because preachers are perfect. I am not perfect at all. 20 years ago, right at 20 years ago, I had been in my, my first church. In fact, I, I, it was not one church. It was two churches, two very small churches in far northwest Oklahoma. And, and there was a church that I had had my eye on for really for about five years at that time. It was in a county seat town. It had beautiful stained glass. It had a high steeple. It was a wonderful church in a wonderful community, and I wanted to raise my kids there. Also, I had a family member that lived nearby, and, and, and that family member and his family, they went to a church in that same community, and so I had my eye on that church. And I knew that I had, I'd, I'd been in my, in my church about five years or so, and typically that's a little bit longer than a, than a pastor would stay in their very first church. And so I knew that it was probably time that I was going to be moved. You may remember back in our United Methodist system, uh, pastors didn't really have much of a say in where they were going to serve, and churches didn't have a say in, in who they were going to get. And so I knew likely that my district superintendent would come to me and say, we need you to move. And and I wanted to be moved to that church. Well, I wasn't moved to that church. Another pastor was moved to that church. And I'd seen this pastor around. I, I knew who this pastor was. I had heard him preach one time, and oh, boy, he was not a very good preacher. <laughs> and, and, I, and I'd seen him interact with other folks, and he was, he was pretty awkward. He was not, he was not what I would call uh, a, a real successful or real prominent preacher, and I, I thought that I, had sh I should have had that church. I should have had that church. And sure enough, the next year that I was, I was moved, I was moved not to a high steeple church, I was moved to the, literally the sixth church in this town of 50,000, and it was a church on the very far northwest corner of, of, that, of that small city, and it was as if I had been forgotten again, and I still had my eye on that church that I was wanting. This sin that we're examining today, the sin of envy, I think is probably the sin of our culture. It is the sin of our culture, though many of us would not ever admit that we have such a sin in our lives. This is the sin of the soul. This is the sin of the secret. This is the insidious sin of the religious. This is the sophisticated, subtle, and religious form of hate, the sin of envy. Now, we know what it is to be envious. We, we likely experienced it when we were growing up, didn't we? I mean, you don't, you, don't have to you don't have to teach children not to share their toys. We come by it quite naturally, don't we? We come by it quite naturally. If, if you want to stir up envy in a child, give their sibling a toy. And very likely, the first sibling has not thought about that toy in months maybe even multiple months, but as soon as their sibling has it, they want that toy. But it doesn't end there with our childhood, does it? When we get to be teenagers, we see teens that have a newer phone than we have. We, have, we see teenagers that have a nicer clothes and name brand clothes that we don't have. We, have we, see our, we see our friends with nicer cars than we were purchased by our by our parents. But then it doesn't end there. It doesn't end there at all. We might think that we have put such childish ways behind us, but then we get into adulthood and we see our co-workers getting ahead of us. We see a neighbor down the, down the, uh, down the street with a nicer yard and a bigger home and a, and, a nicer, and a nicer car. And those old feelings that we had when we were small children, when we were envious of a sibling with a nice toy, they began to well up in us. And then you might think, well, when we get to retirement, surely we put those things behind us. No, I find that folks who are in retirement, even, even in retirement, we look around and we see people who, have, who, who, are, who, are able, who are able to spend their time golfing and who have a second or third house and they are, they are able to, to relax and be in comfort and ease in their retirement while we have to, some of us may have to take a 
may have to take a job in retirement and we're, we're overburdened. We, we don't have time to play golf. No, instead we're burdened by, by doctor's bills and pharmaceutical bills. I find, what I find is that oftentimes when we struggle with envy, we are not envious of people who are in a social status that are far above ours. I mean, we are, not, we are not envious of the Bill Gates of the world. Instead, we are envious of Bill who lives down, who lives down the street who has a newer model car than we have. We're not, we're not envious of Taylor Swift. Instead, we are envious of Taylor who's, who, who doesn't have to put on makeup when she goes to the store and she still looks cute. We're not envious of Patrick Mahomes. We're, we're envious of Pat who we share a cubicle with and his his work is noticed by the boss, and ours never seems to be noticed. Today we're continuing this series dealing with, dealing with these seven deadly sins, and these indeed are deadly to our souls. These are, these are the sins of the heart. And oftentimes, oftentimes we focus on the outward sin of the world. What, the, where, where are these seven deadly? This is where the seven deadly sins came from. In the early church, the second or third century, uh, as, as Christians began to become, uh, began to be persecuted, and well, there were, there were some of the early church fathers, we called them the desert fathers, and th- they, they were so intending to rid sin from their lives that they believed that possibly, just possibly, if they could take themselves out of culture and plop themselves literally out in the middle of the desert, then sin, they wouldn't have to struggle with sin anymore. And so that's what they did. They began to form monasteries in the middle of the desert. They would go out onto, uh, they they would go out by themselves and spend years and decades in caves. And what they found, what the early desert fathers found, was that even when they had, even when they had secluded themselves, even when they had, they had taken themselves out of culture and society and plop themselves by themselves out in the middle of the desert, sin even followed them. And so they, they came to realize that sin was not out there, sin was in here. And so they developed, they began to think through, what, what is it then that we have brought with us out into the wilderness that's in here that, it, that is killing our souls. And so they began to develop this list of seven deadly sins. Last week, Pastor Katie talked about the sin of pride. It is known as the chief of sins. From, from the sin of pride, all other sins, all other sins have their beginnings. Pastor Katie talked about last week how, how we are sinners, not because we sin. No, we sin because we're sinners. We sin outwardly because there is something wrong in our hearts. There is something broken in our hearts. It wasn't, we, weren't inti- we weren't originally intended this way. We were not created this way. No, we were created in the image of God. But you may remember back in the garden, you remember what happened? Sin entered into the picture. Sin entered into the picture, and the relationship between Adam and Eve and God was broken. And then as generation, just even in the second generation, that sin that was simply a broken relationship with God, it was played out in Cain killing his brother Abel. And then humanity devolved from there. We find that there's something deeply wrong inside of us, something deeply wrong inside of us. Envy, I think, is likely the saddest of all of the seven sins. It's the saddest of all the sins. Lust and anger have a a warm-hearted, hot-blooded quality about them, but envy is cold-blooded and cruel. Most of the other seven deadly sins, at least for a little bit, they are, well, they can can be a little bit of fun. Let's, Let's admit it. Lust, at least momentarily, in, in, at least momentarily, is pleasurable. So is gluttony. But envy, it's ne- it's never pleasurable. No one ever enjoys envy, even for a moment. Those who are envious are oftentimes those who are the most pessimistic. Seemingly, seemingly with a with a heavy cloud hanging over their hanging over their heads. While they look at their friends as, as those with good fortune, those who struggle with envy feel like they are, well, they feel like they always have bad luck. It's just a string of bad luck, we often think. Envy, 
Envy makes us sorrowful for another person's good. And that's so sad. So sad when we, when we are sorrowful for another person's good. Envy is simply defined as a feeling of resentment or discontent over another person's superior attainments, endowments, or possessions. And Envy is a desire to, to possess the goods of others. Envy is a desire to possess the goods of others. I lived on a, I grew up on a farm and ranch, and the old story goes that the rancher wants no other land other than what borders his. Think about that for just a moment. The rancher wants no other land other than what borders his. And that was the case of Ahab. Ahab, the king of Israel. This was during the divided kingdom period that we find in our scripture today. Ahab was the king of the northern, the northern kingdom, and Ahab was a ruthless king, a horrible king. Up to this point, he had not just slaughtered dozens. He very likely had slaughtered hundreds. He was not a believer in the one true God. The, the scripture says that he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He had turned his love of God into into idol worship. And so there we have in this story, Ahab had a, as he was sitting in his, in his large palace, he had a neighbor. Naboth was his name. And Naboth had a little, guard, little side garden. And Ahab went to Naboth and said, uh, friend and neighbor, give me your garden. And if you will not give it to me, I will pay you for it. And if and, and, and instead, if, even if you don't want that, I will, I will buy you a vineyard somewhere else that I might have your garden. Did you notice what Naboth said? He said, absolutely, I cannot do that. The Lord forbid that I should give you my inheritance of my father's. Now, what's he talking about? You may remember, if you've read through the Old Testament, that God made a covenant with the Hebrew people. And one of the signs of that covenant, do you remember what the sign of the covenant was? That God was going to give them a promised land. That God was going to give them a land. And that meant that all of the Hebrews owned land. And it had been passed down from their ancestors from one generation to the next generation to the next generation. And the Hebrews of this time, they could trace their land back to many, many generations. And this was the land that had been handed down to them. And this was a sign of the covenant of, of God. And so if Naboth, if Naboth had, had given up his land, in essence, what he would be doing, he would be, turning, he would be, he would be turning and canceling out the, the covenant that God had with him. He, he, would have, he would have been turning from his God. But there was no way that he was going to turn from his God. And here we have Ahab. He goes home. He is sullen. And then there is where his good wife Jezebel comes in. Jezebel asks him, aren't you, the, aren't you the supreme ruler of Israel? Why are you so sullen? Well, my, my, our, our neighbor won't give me his land. Oh, don't you worry about it one bit. So Jezebel comes up with a plan. She is going to call a great fast for all of the community. And she she said, well, when that, when that fast occurs, we're going to, we're going to set, set Jaboth on one side of, of the table, and on the other side of the table, we will, we will seat two scoundrels, and they will stand, and they will make accusations a bit, a, a, a bit against Naboth, that he has cursed God, that he has cursed the covenant of God, and then we'll see what happens. And sure enough, they call a great fast, and it plays out just as the as the evil Jezebel had planned, two scoundrels stood up and accused, and accused uh, him of, of, of well, he accused, they accused him of, of recounting his faith, of, of cursing God, of cursing, cursing the covenant. And sure enough, sure enough, the people, the people took Naboth and they took him outside the city gates and they stoned him. And now guess who became owner of that land? Ahab. As it just so happened, God raised up a prophet by the name of Elijah. And Elijah, God told Elijah, go to Ahab and tell him what he has done. Tell him that the Lord has seen what he did. And so Elijah came 
Ahab said to Elijah, have you found me, O my enemy? He answered, I have found you because you have sold yourself to do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. What was the evil he had done in the sight of the Lord? Absolutely, it was murder. But you know where it began? It began with envy. It began with envy. You see, we, we may believe that this envy that we have in our hearts and in our life, we can keep it a secret. It will never come out. We'll keep it. We'll hold it tight to us. Here's what I found about sin. When we have sin in the heart, it will always come out. It will always come out. It will always play out in our lives. So what are, the, what are some of the symptoms? What are some of the symptoms we find here in the story and in our own lives? I found that one of the symptoms of envy is when we compare ourselves to others. When we compare ourselves to others, when we compare, when we can compare, when we compare our possessions to the possessions of others, we are very likely there is envy beginning in our heart. That's what Ahab was doing. He had the he had the greatest palace on all of the block, not just in all of the block, he very likely had the greatest palace in all of the land. But he was comparing his little guard to Naboth's vineyard. And he knew that Naboth's little garden, he knew that Naboth's little vineyard was better than his, and he was comparing himself to him. Again, we seldom will do that to people who are in, in social fear, spheres that are much higher than ours, but we will do that with our neighbors, won't we? We'll compare our possessions with our neighbor's possessions. We'll compare our yards with our neighbor's yards. We'll compare our cars with our neighbor's cars. Beware, dear friends. Beware, dear friends, of this insidious nature of, insidious nature of envy. A second symptom is that we want what others have. Not only do we compare ourselves to what others have, but we want what others have. Naboth had a vineyard. Ahab didn't. He wanted it. It began, it began right there. We look around and we find people who are smarter than us. We pe find people who are prettier than us. We find people who are thinner than us. We find people who are more successful than us, and we want what they have. God help us. God help. It's a symptom of, that, that, that envy is is lurking right around the corner. So we compare ourselves to others. We, we want what others have. We also, well, secretly, if, if we were to admit it in our heart of hearts, why do we want what other people have? Because we want people to envy us. We secretly want people to envy us. Why did I want that church in that town, in that neighboring town? Because I wanted people to look at me and say, oh, isn't he a great pastor? So sad. So sad that, 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 that we want people to envy us. I wanted people, I wanted people to look at me with a, with a high steeple church in a county seat town with stained glass all around. I wanted people to envy me. You see, that's oftentimes how it goes. You see, I suspect, I suspect that Ahab, even though he was the supreme ruler of Israel, even though, even though he was the king of Israel, even though he had everything that he ever wanted, he really wanted people to envy him. In our heart of hearts, oftentimes that's one of the motivations for envy. Why else? And when I said that I believe that this is the sin of our culture, why else would we spend so much time taking selfies and posting them on social media? There's a thing I read about it a couple years. It's called selfie-itis. It's the addiction to taking selfies. Why else? Why else would we post everything online? Oh, and by the way, when we put pictures online of ourselves, we don't, pick, we don't put pictures of our real life, do we? We, we, don't, we don't put pictures of ourselves when we have bedhead right after we've gotten out of bed. We don't post pictures of ourselves of our failures. No, no, we make sure that we have the exact right filter, maybe even the filter that will take out a little bit of a few lines out of our face. We'll make sure that we have, we have the exact right background. 
God help us, dear friends. Have you noticed that the, that the main reason people have these large, young couples have these large weddings anymore is not so that friends and family can come together together and, and have a wonderful celebration. It's not so that they can confirm this covenant that they are making with one another before God and their family members and friends. No, the main reason that people are having large weddings anymore is for a photo opportunity to post them online. Because we want people to secretly envy us. It's a symptom of envy. Finally, another symptom of envy is when we secretly say to ourselves, and very likely we would never admit this publicly, and we might not even admit it to ourselves, we say to ourselves, I want that person to fail. I want that person that I am envious of, I want them to fail. And so we do our best to help them fail. We sabotage the project of the person who got got our promotion. We daydream about painting graffiti on their door or keying their new car. We campaign for their demotion. We roll our eyes every time they say something in a meeting. We make them the butt of our sarcasm. We chip away at their reputation. We dig for dirt and and we spread it. We tell lies and we gossip. I know I'm maybe treading on some thin ice here. We gossip. You want, to what, you want to know what church members are most known for? Are criticizing and are backbiting and are gossiping. You know why we do those things? Because we are envious. That's why. That's why this is such a deadly and insidious sin. This is the sin of the religious. The non-religious, they hate. Again, there is a hot-blooded nature about hate But being envious, oh, that's for the religious person. It's so cold-natured. I was envious of that church. I wanted them to fail after they got a new pastor. What we're saying when we are envious of other people This is what we are saying. We are telling God, God, the life that you have given me is not enough. That's what we're telling God. When we are envious of another person, when we are envious of other people's possessions, what we are telling God is, God, what you have given me is not enough. And that's what I was telling God. The church that you have given me, God, is not enough. The next year I moved. I was moved to a church about the, about the exact same time, again, about, 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 the, about the exact same size, though it was, in a, it was in the far northwest corner of that community that I, that I served in. And, and so, so I knew that I had been envious about that church, and I, I didn't know what to do about it. I had, I had, I had deep-seated, I don't know that I would have called it hatred because I'm a good religious person, I had deep-seated envy about that church. And I didn't know what to do about it. And so one day I, I read these words out of, the, out of the Gospel of Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount. And it hit me hard. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of the Father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and on the, un- and, and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers, what more do you have than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. I wouldn't have said, I wouldn't have said that, that, that that church in that neighboring community was my enemy, but in my heart of hearts, I've treated them like that. And so I began to pray for them. I began to pray for them. I, I couldn't muster it up myself. It was only what God did in me, and he, con- he so convicted me that I was envious of that church. He began to have me pray for that church. The pastor of that church called me one day, 
we were experiencing some growth in the church that I was a pastor of. And in fact, we were, we were experiencing pretty significant growth, consistent growth, healthy growth. And the pastor of that church called me and I, and, and I began to become friends with him. And I, and I, I realized he wasn't as bad of a pastor as I thought. And, and that church was not as perfect of a church as I thought. In fact, I went into that church and the stained glass windows were cracked and they were crumbling. The, the, the floor of that sanctuary was creaking. And I realized that this was a church in, in, need of, in need of some help. And the things that I had been envious of, I didn't need to be envious of. Instead, God began to change my life and I began to see that church not as something that I was striving for, but this was a church that was my sister church. These were my brothers and sisters. The pastor was my brother in Christ and I began to pray for that church. Again, I didn't muster it up in, my, in, in, my, in myself. It was simply something that the Lord was doing for me and, and in me and, and I found that that's the key. That, that's the antidote. To being envious is to pray God's blessings upon those that we are envious of, to pray that God might bless them, that God might richly bless them, that they have a bigger car than we have. Praise God. May God give them an even bigger car. They are more successful than we are. Praise God. May God make them even more. They're better looking than we are. Praise God. May they, may they age gracefully. You see, I believe that's the antidote. And that's the only way that God can transform our hearts filled with envy into hearts filled with love. Do not hate your enemies. Be kind to them. Pray for them. Love them. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you bow with me? Lord, indeed, you have entrusted to us so much. And God, the life that you have offered to us is indeed enough. We don't need any more other than what you have entrusted to us. Oh God, heal us from this insidious sin of envy. Heal our hearts. Call us to pray for those of whom we are envious Call us to pray special blessings upon them that we might replace this envy in our heart with love and grace. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen.